It's the Prison News Podcast on Spreaker. Greetings and welcome to today's Prison News Podcast. I'm your host. First up, Tennessee sheriff sent to prison for sex with inmates. A rural Tennessee sheriff who admitted to having sex with inmates under his watch was sentenced Wednesday to two years and nine months in prison. Former Fentress County Sheriff Charles S. Chunky Cravens, that's Sheriff Chunky, had already pleaded guilty in the case. On Wednesday, he stood before U.S. District Judge Alita Traeger in Nashville and asked her for her mercy. I do take responsibility for my actions, he told the judge, hands folded behind his wranglers. <laughs> what I done, I done it myself. Traeger sentenced him to the federal prison term for three counts of honest services wire fraud and a count of deprivation of rights. Now, what happens there, what that allows him to do, Chunky gets, he beats having to, uh, after two years, he's no longer has to judge, register as a sex offender, and he can end up working for a school district somewhere. Anyway, let's go back into the, the, the thing here. The, here's what finally brought Sheriff Chunky down. The final count stems from an incident in November when court papers say Chunky Cravens kicked an inmate, handcuffed him, then punched the inmate twice in the back of the head. Cravens must turn himself into federal authorities to serve prison term on October 23rd, according to the judge's order. Now, Cravens was the Chunky Cravens was the top law enforcement officer in rural Tennessee. Now, he's got to picture this now. This sits north of Crossville and has a population of about 1,800. Now, in April, he announced his resignation amid an FBI and a Tennessee Bureau of Investigation probe. Now, just nine days after the FBI knocked on Cravens' door, Chunky pleaded guilty. Now, he lawyered up with a lawyer by the name of Alex Little. And here's what Alex Little said when standing before that judge, helping Chunky to evade, uh, I mean, serious time for what he did. The lawyer said, The person standing before you is not an evil person. Lawyer Little told the judge, he made a mistake. Next, Thailand awaits verdict that could send the former prime minister to prison, Bangkok, Thailand. Friends and foes alike of former prime minister Yingluck Shawantra are anxiously awaiting a verdict Friday by Thailand's criminal Supreme Court on charges that she was criminally negligent in implementing a rice subsidy program that is estimated to have cost the government as much as $17 billion, that's with a B, and it could cost her 10 years in prison. The verdict is generally seen as a political judgment as much as a criminal one. Next, now folks, there's the one here that you're waiting for. Core Civic, one of the dirtiest birds in privatizing the criminal deal, uh, there's an article that shows a little bit of their, their underbelly. Former prison employee describes difficulties with a therapeutic program. A Truesdale Turner Correctional Facility in Hartsville is the largest prison in Tennessee. Inmates and their families, current and former employees, claim that there are plenty of problems at the prison only two years into its operation. I started in the addiction fields about uh, 30 years ago, said Jim Casey. Picked up my bachelor's degree and I picked up my master's. Casey said he was working to create an another award-winning therapeutic prison program before he sold his Indiana home and moved to Tennessee to work for Core Civic. Casey is a licensed drug and alcohol counselor. His resume is loaded with gold stars. Next. This is the update. Escape Central Prison Inmate Captured. Now, first off, the Georgia Department of Corrections says we need your help finding an escape central state prison inmate. According to that release, 37-year-old Jared William Pardue escaped from a mobile work site. Folks, did you hear that? They don't call them chain gangs anymore. They're called mobile work sites. My Lord. He was last seen in a state-issued orange shirt with white pants. And a blue stripe. The guy was six foot four, 225, in real good shape. And they, what they said was anyone who sees him should contact their sheriff's office at 478 751 7500. Now, the update is he's been captured, according to Bibb Lieutenant Randy Gonzalez with the Bibb County Sheriff's Office. Now, this next one has a picture of a girl looking up with a, a pained look on her face. It says, Colorado rapists are avoiding prison sentences because of a bad law. 
We share in the victim's disgust and utter rage that Wilkerson walked free last Saturday, a year earlier than his original sentence. That was, was the cry from someone talking about Colorado's Lifetime Supervision Act. Now, under this law, sex offenders who are sentenced to prison, they remain incarcerated until they can demonstrate they're rehabilitated through a variety of metrics. Metrics. If you guys are working in the, out there, I'll get away from text here for just a minute. These metrics programs, there's an old saying, figures don't lie, but liars sure can figure. And you can make a metric program really make a silk purse out of a sow's ear. Let's get back to texture. But the program, the metric program, has been underfunded and understaffed, meaning that some offenders have spent years in prison waiting to begin treatment. Now, here's some of the sentences. You, 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 you folks out there decide for yourself. There's been a trend in Boulder County of convicted sex offenders getting out of their prison sentences. And here's how they do it. There's Curtis Hilty. He was a real estate agent from Broomfield. He was sentenced to 30 days in jail for raping his children's babysitter. And don't forget the Air Force. A lot of them come out of there. A former Air Force cadet, Daniel Ryerson, who was sentenced to six months in jail after being convicted of sexually assaulting a friend he went to a party with. Now we're reminded that sometimes even those lenient sentences are reduced further by credit for good time. So these guys are just walking out time after time after time, this article says. Next up, Corona pastor Lonnie Reamers turns himself into prison. Now this pastor, folks, there's a big picture of this. I'm telling you, I, I hate to taint the, the broadcast. This guy looks bad. He looks like an undertaker. Sunken eyes, blotchy face, uh, hair immaculately pulled straight back, kind of grayish hair, and the kind of eyes that speak of a lifeless, almost a predatory look. I return to text. Well, what was this guy's name again? Pastor Lonnie Reamers. His last-minute bid to remain free for a few more weeks were denied by Corona Pastor Lonnie Reamers on Tuesday, reported to prison in Lompoc to begin serving his year-and-a-day sentence for his role in swindling $2 million from an Ohio developer. Now, folks, when we look a little bit deeper into this, there's a lot more going on. This guy was what we call plier happy. He wasn't trigger happy. He liked to use pliers on kids and stuff. Um, Reamers in August pleaded guilty to one felony count of conspiracy to commit wire fraud and was ordered to pay $95,000 restitution. Two others involved in the scheme paid money as well. Now, two days before he was to turn himself into federal prison, Remmers, 59 years old now, filed a motion to delay that writing that he had to care for his wife, Lisa, who Remmers said was bedridden with shingles and severe, severe bronchitis, and now she has a vertigo. It would be a great help to his wife and would put defendant Remmers at ease if he could stay home two weeks later, the report said. U.S. District Judge Jeffrey J. Hamlet denied the request without comment. Now, this next part of the story is why you come here to Prison News to hear what really went on. Remmers, Robert Meehlin, and Mark Wittenmeyer solicited $2 million from an Ohio developer, and they had a plan to use monkey assets. Now, Remmers is the head of the Heart of Worship Community Church. This is its folks. Now, these members, many of these members were recovering drug addicts, and they sought refuge with Rem Remmers and his ministry for their troubled lives. Remmers was accused in March 2012 of using pliers during a Bible study to pinch the nipple of a 13-year-old boy as punishment, punishing the teen, according to court testimony. He reportedly had sexually assaulted his sister. Now, the boy had been driven out to the desert by who? By Remmers' stepson, so he's got a family, a crime family here, Nicholas Craig and church members Daryl D. Peters, Jr., they forced the boy, after having his nipple pinched by the pliers, to dig a mock grave as means to warn him about his behavior. The boy was then taken to a group home where he was stripped, zip-tied to a chair, and sprayed with mace, according to court records. Then the boy was taken to this guy's Bible study. Now, as is often the case, there was a whole group of people involved in this child molest what they did to this kid. Now, in Remmers, again, back in 2014, he pleaded guilty to inflicting corporal injury on a child. He pleaded guilty to inflicting corporal injury on a child. This is a separate deal with a deadly non-firearm weapon. He was sentenced to two years in prison. Now, how does that happen? Okay, Craig and Jeter pleaded guilty to inflicting corporal injury on a child. Now, this case also cost a veteran corona police officer who was a member of the church, cost her her job. 
Yeah, she kept quiet when this was going on. Uh, the church member, Corporal Margaret Bell. Margaret Bell, nice cop. Uh, she was told that there were suspicions this boy was being abused. Bell, like people in other professions, she was required to report this kind of abuse or even suspected ab abuse, but she didn't tell the, even the police. Bell was later convicted of failing to report and was fired by the Corona Police Department. Do you think there's not some wickedness in high places, folks? Right now, today, not before, not once in a while. You think it's not bad out there? You think maybe Jesus was right? You think maybe when the Bible says these kinds of people are going to come up out of the woodwork in the end times? Well, let's, let's read a little bit more here. We're only 10 minutes into this thing. This is prison news. Appleton woman gets two years in prison for a grand shoot armed robbery. Now, you don't see a 19-year-old woman very often take a weapon and go into an armed robbery, but you do here. On January 15th, a man reported to police that a woman, well, he says a woman, two men, had just robbed him. And then he went on to say that he, uh, they put him in, uh, in a vehicle, pulled him out of a restaurant, and then the men grabbed him by the neck, and one held a, head to his pist uh, a pistol to his head, and then made him give his... his uh, pin numbers and drained his account. That's not the kind of thing that, you know, is really a big deal. It happens all the time. Now, a man pleads guilty to assaulting a fellow jail inmate. Now, think about this, folks. Remember, I've, I've discussed with you, I've tried to teach you about these private prisons and why you don't want to go that way. Instead of standing trial as scheduled, a 24-year-old Indianapolis man Wednesday pleaded guilty to felony criminal confinement and battery by means of a deadly weapon attack earlier this year on his cellmate at the Madison County Jail. Where was the jail guards? I weren't there. In return for Justin Hardy's guilty plea, the Madison County Prosecutor's Office agreed to drop the most serious charge of level 3 forcible felony rape and a level 6 felony strangulation. How would you like to have this guy in your, be caught for some unpaid traffic tickets or somebody found some uh, contraband in your car and you end up with this guy in your cell? Madison Court Division Judge Angela Warner Sims took the proposed agreement under advisement, ordering a pre-sentencing investigation. The 31-year-old male victim told jail officers the assault began at about 1230 in the morning, you know, like one o'clock in the morning. In his cell after lockdown, according to a probable cause affidavit filed in this case. Now, the Herald Bolton doesn't publish names of sexual assault victims, so they're you know he, there's talk about somebody's trying to set somebody up, whatever that's supposed to mean. Anyway, this guy resisted, but Harrison pulled him off a bunk and choked him until he passed out. When he regained consciousness, the assault continued and escalated with help from another inmate. The victim told investigators, so one inmate strangling another inmate, and that other inmate being strangled is being sexually abused by these two cats. Why were three of these guys in one prison cell during lockdown? That would be a question, wouldn't that? The man, 26-year-old Kramer Hill, uh, excuse me, the man, 26-year-old Kramer Hill uh, block of Broadway, this isn't written right here, was charged with level 5 felony battery resulting in serious injury and level 6 felony criminal confinement. The case against Hill is still pending. Of course it's still pending. Although the prisoner tried to yell rape, the assailants covered his mouth according to the probable cause statement. During that part of the attack, he allegedly kicked the victim several times in the lower back area. The victim was treated for injuries at St. Vincent's Anderson's Hospital after the attack. He met with investigators when he was brought back to the jail. Harrison and Hill allegedly waived their rights and agreed to speak. Well, well I'm not going to read this anymore, folks. You, 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 if you follow this, been with us for any length of time, you know what happens. Uh, there's an old saying that uh, when a criminal can hit you in the head with a pipe and he can get out of prison before you get out of the hospital, that you know Jesus was right. And that's kind of what we're seeing here over and over and over again. But now we've got some great news. We're going to segue over to the McGuffey's readers. Now, these are the McGuffey's readers that Henry Ford, the guy that started Ford Motor Company, he cited as one of the most important childhood influences in his life. He was an avid fan of McGuffey's readers. Now, the first editions, which are real hard to get, and I can't even get some here, but I'll be reading some samples, uh, and claimed as an adult to be able to quote from McGuffey's readers by memory. That's how Henry Ford got started. He would republish all